Morning Moon. to 
really navigate these new dimensions of trust that will appear as we transition into this new area. So given the importance of each, I want to spend a bit of time in each to explain how they can help you in preparation for this area. We'll start first off by looking at strategy and roadmap, which is really just navigating your enterprise through your tools and AI journey, really just the beginning. So we've seen an accelerated uh, uptake of Gen AI. And in fact, a lot of our survey data goes us out. The survey we did just in July, nearly 80% of companies that we surveyed are either making significant investments or early exploration. So it's a large focus on developing use cases to employ with automation on one hand, and also JAI. Now, many of you probably have an automation roadmap in place, but you're gonna have to adjust this roadmap now considering what's happening with JAI, considering the following factors. We're gonna see a lot of new JAI use cases, partly coming through the business. Secondly, you're gonna see more direct involvement of C-level executives are going to be directly involved in helping to find these cases given the potential risk and impact it has on their businesses or their operations. And you're going to see a lot of new offerings coming from your technology partners. We're going to be offering new types of AI and Gen AI offerings to support them. Now, your roadmap should really serve uh, to set internal expectations for organization, but can also help inform you if you're really working with the right external technology partners when it comes to the execution and implementation of POCs and various use cases. So, what are your peers interested in when it comes to many of these Gen AI use cases? And we also ask organizations this question What generative AI use cases do you anticipate having the most promise in your organization? And as you can see here, knowledge management applications absolutely make sense for you to force get our data organized, prepare so we can make sense of it. Conversational apps such as Chatbot, uh, code generation apps such as Microsoft, Microsoft GitHub, or design apps such as Microsoft Design. What's important to notice here is that these are the types of new cases that span different parts of your organization. You know, anywhere from R and D and software development to sales and marketing. So it's an important indication that when you develop your use case in your roadmap, you need to have these executives as part of that development and conversation. But we also have a strong IT efficiency play. If you think about some of those challenges for IT today, innovation velocity, or challenges with expenditures, or challenges with uh, sufficient skills and expertise available, there are other use cases that are important. Software development, um, you know, enabling those coders, those programmers, and developers to free up more time to focus on innovation as opposed to managing the life cycle of their applications. Or addressing cost considerations, technical debt, for example, or looking to uh, make the IT operations more efficient, more cost effective, particularly incorporating automation uh, into the cloud. So when you think about the roadmap, and you think about strategy, roadmap, and use cases, um, again, it's important to include all the stakeholders in this discussion, particularly for the possibility for clusters of overlap. And we think it's important to pursue the following process. You need three components. You need an ideation process that pulls in all the relevant stakeholders. So if you look at those use cases, they're lined with a vision that you have for how AI can support the organization and business going forward. Next, we have what we call an assessment. And it's really taking those use cases and trying to, trying to break them in terms of importance and impact. So use cases about value and complexity. So you can look at value, for example, economic value, either revenue generation or cost savings, or strategic alignment, perhaps going after your customer set, or launching a new product set, and so forth. Um, and then you have the complexity. Now, I've been involved in quite a few Gen AI discussions personally, the business has great ideas, but then when you work with IT, you realize some of these are really complex and really costly to do. You underestimate that. So looking at challenges with the data, do we have the data organized? Can we use it? Can it be impactful? Uh, look at process systems, and do you have the required know-how internally? And then we have the third place, which is prioritization. You can use different methodologies for this. For example, with an IDC, we use something called the RICE methodology to help prioritize use cases. But it's important to map this out so then you can see you know, are there clusters? Are there areas that are high risk for the organization and so forth? And then you have the whole factor of execution that's in place. Do we do it ourselves? 
Do we have sufficient resources? Do we partner with an external organization? Do we partner with the big um, AI companies that's emerged, and so forth? And then ask the really hard questions. Don't forget to ask about, do we have to make changes to processes? Do you have to make changes to the organization? What about educating the workforce? What about culture? So all these factors need to be considered in this type of roadmap development. So let's go on to the next one, uh, the next area of our readiness model, um, looking at building that data-centric platform. With AI everywhere, AI is really, AI everywhere, AI is really the, the core technology that is the center of the platform transformation. And platform transformation is really focused on data and how we use data, both for inputs, so to inform those language models and other developments that we have, and also for outputs. Think of you know, supporting customers, developing new products and services, and so forth. But there's a problem here. And that problem is that we're creating, creating lots and lots of data. And in fact, our, our work around what we call the data sphere estimates that by 2026 that we'll be creating seven petabytes of data per second. Moreover, many organizations don't know what data they have within the organization, what data they have, where it's at, and how to use it for, for effectiveness. And in fact, for a super survey, we interviewed uh, uh, enterprises, and 42% indicated that they have underutilized data within uh, their organization. So how do we address this? Well, we think it's important that organizations develop, develop four capabilities, as summarized here. First is information synthesis. So that's assessing and analyzing information, so creating knowledge for the organization. Secondly, insights and delivery. So taking that knowledge and providing it to the right stakeholders and users with the right content, in the right time frame, and also with the right scale. Thirdly, collective learning. So this is really collaborative, sharing information across all parts of the organization to help make better decisions. And then finally, and generate a data culture, which includes investment in technology and training to improve data literacy within your organization. Now, these, many of you are developing some of these capabilities, but what we see is that most organizations tend to develop just one or two, but they really should be executing on all four. And this is part of the result that quite often within organizations we have information silos. Think about customer data or finance data, or supplier data, quite often it's not linked within the organization. So how can you address this? Well, we think you need to address this by focusing on developing enterprise intelligence architecture. And this architecture has four components, as you can see, we call four planes, and also four sets of, let's say, um, actors, or, or let's say, uh, uh, roles that support this wider uh, enterprise intelligence architecture. And it really starts at the bottom of the data plan. And these are these roles and functions, of course, using various tools and applications and so forth that are collecting and managing your core data, which we know is complex and it sits in a lot of different uh, tools and applications. And then we have the data control plan. This is where the data engineers and the data stewards come in. They're providing context and governance. In other words, organizing the data so it can help and lead to potentially intelligent decisions. And then we have the data analysis plan. And this is where the data sciences, the data analysts get active. We're taking that intelligence plane and then adding capabilities and analysis to it to really draw new insights and information. And then we have the decision making plan. This is where the users, the executives, use various tools and so forth to draw up that information to inform and make decisions for, for the business. Now, you need to develop all four and so there's some 50 technologies, if I go back just for a moment, if you look at all these, you know, these different activities, there's some 50 different technologies that we capture coming from lots of different uh, vendors. And one of the challenges you're going to face is how do you, you know, pull this together and integrate uh, to, to serve all these particular needs you'll have with your uh, enterprise, uh, your enterprise intelligent architecture. So it means you have to focus on looking on integration, and also where you can get the best um, TCO from different types of tools and applications to bring it together because there's not a vendor out there that offers all these capabilities 
at once. You also need to consider the following when building this data platform. Uh, first of all, look at his strategy. Instead of starting from the bottom, from the data plan moving up, as many companies do, you need to start from the top down. And think about the decisions that executives need to make and to build this stuff further. Second, you need to look at investments in all the initiatives, but particularly that, that second level looking at the data control plan. Because if you don't have information that has context, that has governance, you're not going to be able to really get to the data scientists and also to the executives that it should be planned to be in the day. The data will be unusable really to inform decisions. We just talked a bit about technology. You have to consider um, you know, vendors with open standards to ensure that you have some level of interoperability. There are a lot of niche components uh, to this architecture that's out there today. It's going to be a big challenge for you to pull much of this capability together. And then we have the people factor. Um, it's really about focusing on what the decisions need to be made as a focus on developing what data they need. So think about the bigger picture to help with the decision, intelligent decision making process. Let's move on to the next one. And it's in the area where you think about how your organization provides the infrastructure that's necessary to support the AI workflows at scale, but also at reasonable cost. If you're like most companies today, you're probably spending up to 50% of your IT spending on cloud and cloud-related services. And you probably have concerns about how, how cloud expenditures are growing. And in fact, in a survey we did this last year with CEOs, and 54% or more than half indicated they're extremely concerned about the out-of-control cost for cloud and cloud usage and consumption. Moreover, in the CIO service, and two-thirds of CIOs indicated that they're unable to keep their cloud costs on budget, their cloud spending on budget, and they also have concerns about this. And what it means is within organizations today, we see more and more that we've had this focus on cloud first, it's been a discussion about cloud, but now the conversation is switching to cloud economics. So how to address this cost? And if your cloud costs are out of control now, just wait to see what happens with the impact of Gen AI. Think of the consumption of these large language models when it comes to compute data and storage and so forth. And in fact, if you look at the bigger picture, um, AI and Gen AI alone account for, already accounted for a much larger share of overall global infrastructure spend, to the point that by 2025, we think it's like 25% of, of global server spend will stem from investment uh, in AI solutions. And this is particularly happening among the large platform companies, the cloud providers, of course, which are investing in infrastructure to assist their customers and organizations uh, to do uh, uh, large language model testing uh, and, and other types of development. So they consume a lot of compute and so forth. We're also going to see a major increase in spending on AI compute instances in businesses when it comes to the cloud. You can see something like 173%, so a tremendous increase. Now, the reality is that cloud, of course, Offers a scalability, right? Offers all these types of services that can be used for large, for language model, for uh, uh, foundational model, large language model development. But it's going to come at a steep cost. So how to do this? Well, one thing that organizations that we see are doing is they're turning to FinOps. And in fact, we believe that something like seventy percent of the, the G one thousand companies across the world. Um, will really invest in the next year within what we call FinOps maturity. So they're moving from how to predict cost to actually putting governance in place to better manage cost. And they're doing this in different ways. Some of the initial best practices we see, of course, to a lot out there are the following. Um, one is an example of Chevron, which is looks at a world-class contracting and how that influences discounts that kick in with certain utilization rates. So what's about LinkedIn, uh, over to Chevron, he, he introduced what we call translating uh, cloud consumption set of utilization data um, and tracking business and the business understood utilization rates and understood that if they use a certain amount of cloud consumption in a certain period of time, that they could have uh, uh, discounts that would kick in and be better, of course, for, for the business. Or take the case of uh, Angela Apple from, uh, um, from, uh, from the French company, Gobain, a construction company. Um, who had to build trust within his organization to get his business agents to think about cloud consumption. 
So he put some tools and practices in place as a test. And building confidence and trust was then able over time to add additional uh, context and practice to help his organizations manage cloud consumption collectively with, with, with him. And then finally, we can simply employ tools. Um, at UPS, they employed a FinTech tool, for example, that they would really look at their contracts with the supplier to see if the vendor's predictions about spending were accurate. And in this particular case, they used a tool that enabled them to, enabled them to save $10 million on a contract because they realized that the vendor's estimates were incorrect. So there's a lot of possibilities and best practices now that are emerging uh, to manage, uh, manage cloud cost. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, and this is really preparing your organization for those uh, new roles and also those skills that will be most demanded in this new era. Um, and uh, just to reference the World Economic Forum report, as you can see, something like 1.1 billion jobs will be radically transformed by tech in the next decade. And it's down to some 44% of employers' skills will change within the next five years. This really caused me to think about how you can focus on finding those roles and also finding and developing those skills that will be most of demand in the future of this new era. The reference to other jobs report put out from the World Economic Forum, we looked at try looking at data both of the jobs to be created and the jobs that would, would disappear. And as you can see here, uh, not so surprisingly, AI and machine learning special are really at the top in terms of new jobs created. But if you look at the next set, it comes back to my point about a data platform. Business intelligence analysts, um, data analysts and scientists, uh, big data specialists, uh, data engineers, and of course, we have security. But it's not just about the technical skills. We also have the question of the non-technical skills. So in this example, I've taken uh, the example of the AI, AI and ML, job spec, and we've mapped that to what we have at IDC, we call our ICs, IDC, our skills development framework. And as you can see, in one hand, we need those technical skills. That is the job. But let's not lose sight of the non-technical, because equally important are digital business skills. You know, looking at the ability to analyze, looking at the ability to work with customers, you know, data literacy, or human skills, communication skills, collaboration skills, um, you know, creative thinking, leadership skills, thinking about what's changing with the workforce, you know, talent management, um, empathy and active listening, leadership and social influence. And to illustrate this more specifically, I've taken the example of the AI prompt engine. Of course, it's one of those jobs that's being created in, in large volume uh, as we go through this era. And of course, the prompt engineers specialize in developing, as you can see, optimizing AI-generated text prompts. Uh, and so forth. But what is important to notice is the mix between technical and non-technical skills. And as you can see, three-fifths of the required skills are really non-technical. Strong communication skills, collaboration and analytical thinking. Of course, we need this technical, but the reality is what we need to think about when you look for those new roles, when you look for the skills you need to develop, you need to think as much about the non-technical skills as just the technical skills for your organization. Let's move on to the next, next point, which is really about navigating the new dimensions of trust. And you've all heard the adage, trust takes years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. And we know that trust, or developing trust, or maintaining trust is getting more difficult and complex. You've had to adjust and evolve trust as you do with your customers and as you do evolve your digital, uh, digital business model. You've had to deal with cybersecurity threats. You've had to deal with a lot of new legislation, privacy legislation, such as GDPR. And as we move through this automation phase, you're going to have to deal with new dimensions of trust that you're going to uh, have, to, have to build. And let me illustrate this last point um, with, a, with a few examples. So the state of Illinois in the United States um, passed a law that uh, the Biometrics Information Privacy Act that required companies to get the uh, consent of both employers and customers. And also the policies in place that looked at what they did with the data, storage, data retention, and usage. 
And after passing this law, we've seen a slew of, of, of cases, legal cases that have emerged from this. Um, for example, Instagram, or that is parent company of Instagram, was sued for $7 million by the state of Illinois for using biometrics without the consent of users. Uh, it's had to pay, pay a fine. Or we have Walmart, which if you enter into a Walmart store, has security cameras and security surveillance um, throughout their stores. Again, this is considered a violation of biometrics. So Walmart is collecting data, allegedly um, uh, legally, and is being sued by the state of Illinois. Or if you take the classic case of Google, of course, which is, which is feeding its language models with data that's collected from users in Illinois, you know, online statistics, other types of information, without their consent. So we have three examples just from my mom. We can expect a lot more of this to take place going forward. Um, if you really think about, we saw the impact of the EU's GDPR, and now, of course, the EU's AI law, or body of legislation is coming into place. It'll have an impact on what we do with security. Internally, though, uh, trust is really the responsibility of kind of a wide, wider uh, C-suite, each of which has a particular role to play. So you can say the chief financial officer when it comes to financial risk, or the marketing officer when it comes to brand exposure uh, in the market, um, the data office, of course, we just talked about, um, you know, legal compliance, and a whole host of those. The point here is that really all these actors have the table to ensure that you have consistent and comprehensive input to building a trust strategy uh, within the organization. It can be fold out of those credits risk for your organization. Now, that's what you do internally, but externally you have another challenge. Because as you start to you know, work with companies when it comes to automation and Gen AI, you may be working with different companies than you did before. These organizations may be bringing new type of risk into your organization. So when we ask organizations, um, you know, who are they going to partner with over the next couple of months when it comes to Gen AI? Uh, you can see we have the public cloud providers, um, we have IT consultants, and we have Gen AI tool providers. Now, these are a different set of companies than what, let's say, you traditionally would work with when it comes to your kind of core IT infrastructure, right? You might be working with infrastructure providers, ERP vendors, and so forth. So, you're going to have to think about the relationship with these new providers as you begin to work with them to think about you're going to need more transparency and a lot more understanding of what do they do with your data, how they use it, and so forth. You know, think of working with IT consultants um, and what could potentially happen in, in these, new, these new AI companies. So this is going to be a new focus of thinking about building trust in your organization and how to, how to manage that. So in closing, uh, we've, went, we've gone through a lot of, a lot of different bits and pieces and IT has a lot of information about these different areas. Um, but again, think about this readiness model, um, the strategy and roadmap. Um, you need to continuously update your, your AI roadmap, the um, GenAI roadmap. It's going to be a live document, giving what's happening in terms of technology and the potential use cases that come up. And then think about those other factors what processes need to change, how do you educate your employees, um, uh, et cetera. And then we have the second point, the intelligent architecture, building this data, database, this data platform. Um, you need to think about investing across those four planes at the time, but it's critical to have that, that, uh, that uh, the, the, the second the second digital plane. Um, but you really need all of these to build that enterprise intelligent architecture for a period of time. And then we have digital infrastructure. We talk about the you know, cascading uh, expenses around the cloud. But think about what you can do in terms of FinOps and working with your business units, your business leads, as well as your finance, um, your finance department. And then you have the skills. So think about a program working with your HR uh, for attracting the, those new roles and skills that will be most demanding. But let's not forget the amount of upskilling and reskilling that you're going to have to do with your organization as you move through this era. Uh, and finally, we talked about um, this expanding focus on trust, and we've got an internal job to do, but also think about the transparency and the collaboration you need with many of your new technology partners as you begin to implement the AI. Thank you for your attention. In order to overcome these challenges, I've been following up with the solutions that we offer at TX1, which will help in implementing 
those best practices. So what we have seen for the last few years is the attacks on the critical infrastructure is increasing day by day. In the past, so I, let's say till 2017, when we thought about the attacks on OT or the critical infrastructure, these were sophisticated attacks and ICS specific attacks. That means most of them were nation sponsored or state sponsored attacks. But with the IT OT convergence, today it is becoming a lot more easier for the attackers to compromise the OT network. So what we are seeing today is the typical worms in the network and the targeted ransomware attacks. So the IT convergence has made it a lot easier because we use the same technologies that we use in IT. So, we have seen the increase of these attacks throughout 2022 and we have several stories of uh, cyber attacks happening in 2023 as well. And in the recent days, the supply chain attack, the ransomware attack and the advanced persistent threats are the trend that we are seeing in terms of OT cybersecurity attacks. So, what are the challenges that we have? So, what kind of challenges are we seeing in terms of implementing this OT security? So, because the number of attacks are increasing, it is very natural to assume that the cybersecurity practices are also increasing on the OT side. But unfortunately, that is not the case. Several CISOs have been, and CIOs, of course, have been tasked with the responsibility of managing the OT security along with their IT security. Now, OT is a different word altogether. Right? So I would probably say we are at least seven to 10 years behind in terms of implementing cybersecurity practices in OT networks as compared to IT. Now, why is it? So the very first thing is that I'd say the challenges in OT are quite different than what we see in IT. So I'm here to highlight a few of them today. So the first challenge is that we have uh, the new equipment coming in from suppliers. Now, with the increase of supply chain attacks, we have seen that the new equipments are sometimes coming with a pre-installed malware. Now imagine plugging in an equipment or a system which is pre-installed with malware into an OT network. Now we have recently seen this, I think somewhere in the May of 2023, happened with Android devices. Of course it's not OT. So the Gorilla malware was installed, pre-installed on brand new Android phones. 9.3 million phones were infected with the Gorilla malware. Now imagine that happening to the things in uh, the OT side. That can have a very devastating consequences. Then we have the problem of legacy exit. Now this is one of the most common challenge that we have seen across every critical infrastructure. Right, so now what does this bring in? So this bring in the vulnerabilities, the older software, the older operating system will bring in their vulnerabilities and that becomes a low hanging fruit for the attackers. Now it is not uncommon to see Windows XP, Windows 2000, Windows 2003 servers being used in the OT environment still. I'm pretty sure most of you, or at least few of you might not even have seen uh, Windows uh, XP. Okay, so, but we still use it in, in the OT world. Followed by that, we have the problem of uh, flat networks. So when the, the network was designed for OT, it was designed to keep it a gap. So it was not too much considered from a security standpoint because thinking that it would be a gap. However, so today, because of the ITOT convergence, so we have to make sure that actually these flat networks are addressed because it will make the attacker very easy for any kind of attack propagation, maybe in terms of a lateral movement or a malware movement. Followed by that, we also have the challenge of remote connectivity. So this kind of shot up with the COVID. Right, so during COVID, let's say the OT technicians, the maintenance engineers were supposed to connect to the OT networks and that made companies implement poor or let's say not so secure remote connectivity solutions. 
we can recall the attack that happened on the Florida water treatment plant. So there, the attacker used a compromised team lever axis in order to increase the level of hydrogen uh, peroxide into uh, to a very dangerous level. And so luckily, it was identified in a secondary level of check and it was stopped. Right, so. Then followed by that we have the heterogeneous system. The OT is different. We have a different set of applications, we have different set of protocols, we have different security needs in OT. So if we try to bring in the IT security solutions that we have and try to make them work in the OT environment, so it will not work. It is very hard to detect the attacks in the space of OT by IT security solutions. And so far by that, we have the use of USB devices, right? So we're talking about very simple things. The thing is, these simple things are what are bothering uh, the OT industry. Use of USB is quite common. We have probably solved this challenge in IT years ago. But in OT, it's still prevalent. Now why is that? Because the use of USBs, are, uh, the, the USB devices are required in order to, let's say, they carry the hot fixes, or the firmware upgrades for the OT systems because of the air dampness of the OT uh, environments. Now these little devices can actually be the carriers of malware that can bring down the OT environment. Followed by that, we have uh, the poor visibility challenge. Let's say it's, it's very difficult to even for a CIO or a CISO to understand what's happening in the OT. So, the moment we start talking to the OT engineers, so they'll be like, don't touch us. The OEM vendors, the OT engineers, I'm pretty sure like some people who are managing OT environments, you might have already seen this uh, problem. Now because of the poor visibility, so what you don't know, you cannot do anything about it, right? So you cannot detect threats if you don't know what's happening in the network. Now followed by this, so we also have the asset management program. So I was looking at to manually go to every single plot and look into the vertical management boards, look under the devices in order to get the CTM number of each and every single asset. Right, so it's a very manual task and a lot of time consuming tasks that we need to do in terms of asset management. Now, in order to address these security challenges, the industry definitely has a good cybersecurity practices in order to make sure that like, so we have the resilience in ISIS uh, landscape. So, they are divided into two uh, categories. The first one is the network category, where we have uh, the use of layer two segmentation. Right, so we have to segment the OT network, the problem that we solve in the flat network. That flat network should be segmented uh, in the layer two. Then we have the need for virtual patching. Now this is very important. We have virtual patching in IT as well, but it becomes much more important in OT because it approximately takes uh, 146 days in order to develop a patch by the OEM vendors. This is according to the Trend Micro Zero Day Initiative Research. So imagine that, like, 146 days to release a patch. Now, after the patch is released, it's a different story of taking the necessary downtime in order to implement uh, the patches. That's where a compensating control like virtual patching becomes very essential in the OT networks. Now, followed by that, from the asset category of best practices, we have uh, obviously we have to harden the assets and try to patch whenever the, the patch is available, patch the authorities as soon as possible. Followed by that, we have to implement the malware scanning. Can you imagine this? So we're talking about this having an antivirus installed in the system. So we knew this for the last maybe about 35, 40 years. But in OT, we are seeing still the companies not even having an antivirus solutions on their systems. Because the OEM vendor says no, not install any third-party agents. Right? So and then we have another uh, best practice of regularly inspecting the disconnected devices. So because of the air gapness of the OT environments, a lot of systems are not connected, especially to a centralized management uh, console. So we do not have a good visibility, so it becomes necessary in order to scan these solutions at a regular intervals. 
Now these solutions sound very simple. However, considering the challenges that we just talked about, it is very difficult to implement. Unless there are, there are solutions that can help us to implement these best practices. That's why PX1 Networks comes into picture. PX1 Networks is a OT native cybersecurity company. We have designed solutions in order to in, in order to be implemented in OT networks. So these solutions are divided into three categories. The first one is the network defense, where we have an edge series of product. Then we have endpoint protection, where we have the stellar series of product, and then we have the security inspection, which is the element series of product. Now. I have created a table here to highlight what are the challenges that each of these solutions can solve. For example, considering the equipment for the suppliers. So this problem can be solved using a portable inspector. This cute little device is a agentless, USB-based, agentless malware scanning tool that can be used in order to inspect every equipment that is coming into the network. It's a and then the problem with legacy asset can be solved using our Edge IPS and Edge Fire, which are an IPS solution and a firewall solution designed specifically for OT networks. We also have Stellar Protect, which is our IT order solution, again designed for OT systems. The portal inspector can also work with several legacy systems. And when we talk about legacy, we are talking about again Windows XP, RX version 6. Uh, Windows 2000 servers, probably around 20, 50 to 20 year old uh, softwares. The problem with uh, the black networks can be solved uh, using the edge IPS and the edge fire, what we call as a network segmentation, which is very essential in the OT network. The beauty of this product is that we do not have to redesign the network architecture. We do not have to change the IP schema uh, in, of the OT network. So these devices can sit transparently in the network and start inspecting without much efforts. Followed by that, we have the, uh, the heterogeneity problem, which is not at all a problem for PX1 because from ground up, PX1 solutions are built for OT networks. So we understand around 8,000 plus OT applications and we understand around 70 plus OT protocols. This makes the DX solutions very much capable of identifying any kind of threats that can happen in the OT environment. The problem of USB devices can be solved using Stellar Protect, which is the IT level solution through which we can block the use of USB devices. And then we also have Safe Mode, which can be used, which is a kiosk based solution, which can be used to scan a third party USB stick to make sure that it is free of malware. The problem of code visibility can be addressed using Edge IPS, portal uh, inspector, and element one. So here, when we talk about visibility, PX1 solutions can help you to understand the IP addresses, the MAC addresses, the serial numbers, the firmware versions of all the devices. It could be an IP camera, it could be a PLC device, it could be a printer, it could be a Windows machine, a Linux machine. So any of these control systems. So we will be able to identify the IP, Mac, worker version, the hardware uh, vendor, the models, and other things. With the portal inspector, uh, the USB-based scanning solution again, apart from doing a typical malware scan, it also collects uh, several asset details and the vulnerabilities present in the system that it scans. Right? So thereby giving us a good visibility into uh, the asset details as well as the vulnerability details. Then we have the problem of asset management, which can be solved using uh, the Edge IPS and Edge Fire, Stellar Protect, and the Element One. Again, here we will uh, consideration that, uh, uh, the consideration is taken into account for all the IP addresses, MAC addresses, uh, followed by uh, the vulnerabilities present. The list of applications running on each and every single OT system can all be identified uh, through uh, the Element One. Then comes the remote connectivity problem, which can be solved using the edge fire because edge fire has the feature uh, uh, that's a uh, feature of VPN connection so we support both remote VPNs as well as the point to point uh, VPN. So where do these uh, 
solutions figure. So if you consider a typical uh, infrastructure, uh, this is a, a very generic architecture of a refining and a purifying factory. So we can put the edge IPs in the networks. They have different models, uh, ranging from 102 will support 200 Mbps, all the way up to a higher end device supporting till 20 Mbps. Depending on the requirement, if you want to secure one single OT system or one single PLC, we can place a smaller IPS. Or uh, if you require to set to secure the whole segment of a plant, then we can use a bigger version, which is IPS Pro 1048 or 296. Then we have the Edge Fire, which is an industrial firewall, next generation industrial firewall, which can help you in layer 3 segmentation and detail solutions. And in order to manage multiple instances of these devices, we have the Edge One, which is a centralized management console. Stellar Project Legacy Mode. This is an IQS agent designed for traditional operating system, legacy operating system. So Windows XP is supported, Windows 2000 servers are supported with Stellar Project, a legacy one. And we also have Stellar Project, which is an IQS solution for the modern operating system, Windows 7 and above. Followed by that, we have the Stellar One, which is the centralized management console for multiple instances of Stellar Project and Stellar Project and legacy. Uh, now again, this is another beauty of TXP product. So both the legacy uh, as the, the legacy agent and the modern agent can be managed through one common console. Then we have the portal inspector, which is a security inspection device. Now we'll talk about inspecting the disconnected systems regularly. We can use portal inspector to scan the machines that are not online. And then we have Element One, which is a centralized management console for multiple portal inspectors. We also have Safe Code, which is a kiosk based solution in order to scan the uh, uh, USB drives, external USB drives. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Morning Moon.